the most fun for me it's because it's new stuff it's really in 2019 that uh, we have come to take advantage take advantage of this uh, functionality all right uh, here's my powerpoint So I will start on page 158 of the, uh, the PowerPoint slides. And I will talk about photorealistic rendering for data visualization. <clears throat> Everybody's here, yes? OK, all right. So we're going to review the old classic OpenGL programming and, and rendering and then move to the modern ray tracing uh, rendering. Yes, I can. This is the one, yeah. Paraview photorealistic rendering for data viz. So here's the summary of my presentation here. It's basically go from the classic, the old style OpenGL as it has existed for over 20 years now to the, the more modern uh, stuff. <clears throat> this is the final image, and this is the data I have provided for you for the exercise. What do we see in this image? There's a lot of uh, pretty advanced rendering going on. So reflection, reflection in that particular on that particular surface right here. We see shadows right over here and elsewhere we see refraction through the volume of water. And you know, there's, this, there's the classic picture of the, I don't know, your spoon or whatever in your bicchiere, or do we say, your glass of water. And that's exactly what I wanted to reproduce. So we have it here, and we have the reflection of it right here as well. And I will not tell you how many hours I have spent making this looking just right, okay? And then what we have really is materials which behave differently. So this material here reflects light, this one does not. Okay, so we'll, we're going to be able to do all those uh, different things. But let's start from the beginning. At the beginning, so this is the history of computer graphics, there was ambient lighting. So a uniform color everywhere here on this surface, independent of the orientation of the surface. Same thing here. So we know it's a cylinder, but if we didn't know, uh, you could hardly guess. How do we do this rendering? For every pixel here, if I pick one pixel on my screen, every object contributes, every, every object is projected onto the screen. And the Z buffer technique, the Z buffer tells me for every object, the depth of that object. So usually we count uh, this as being the X axis, the Y axis is normal, and the Z axis goes into the screen. And this classic Z buffer technique tells me here, I keep the pixel that is closest to me, and that's it. It's very nice because it allows a brute force rendering of the primitives. Everything gets rendered. We don't have to do any classification until the very end. We keep the closest pixel. That's it. Then we made some progress. We change the illumination of the surface here based on the orientation. As you can see, this surface here and this, the top surface, they see more light. And we will see later on that I have placed the source of light over here, over here, far away in that corner of the room. So you can imagine that there's more light over here. And this light, this wall here, sees less light. 
and we will also later on show the shadows behind that cylinders. Anyway, this is called diffuse lighting. And for this, we need surface normals. <clears throat> How do we switch from OpenGL to Osprey to ray tracing? Well, basically, on the graphical user interface, you do this. You enable ray tracing here at the bottom of your screen. And if you do it in Python, you do it like this. You get your render view and you enable the ray tracing with a flag of one. And then we will have three different back ends. I will talk about this later on. This for the moment shows no shadows. We can turn the shadows on at a later time. So this would be the ray tracing image. It doesn't show any different than a couple of slides earlier. Well, there is one difference, but otherwise not so much. This is ray tracing. And from the point of view of speed, uh, this is a small model, so it's interactive. No, no problem for, for me on my laptop here. I can do more. I can add shadows, just like this. <clears throat> so it sounds obvious, but if you don't define a light source, there will be no shadows. It's like switching the, the electrical switch when you enter the room. So you must define a light, and then there will be shadows. Now, those in computer graphics, we call those hard shadows. Why so? It's because the boundary between the light and the dark side is exactly a binary thing, zero or one. Well, in reality, it's not like this. Look on your table at any object. There is a, there is a, a small zone where the light intensity changes from zero to one. So those hard shadows are not realistic. Look carefully at the difference between this and that. See, particularly here, particularly here, I like very much this. This is a so-called soft shadows, and it's a lot more realistic. It's a lot closer to reality. Don't confuse this with light diffraction. This is yet another term. This is not light diffraction. Light diffraction is the famous picture of uh, the Pink Floyd album. If you still listen to Pink Floyd, I do. That's light diffraction on the prism. This is not light diffraction. This is the fact that the sun, or our light in this particular case, is not a point light source, so there's not a single line, just like a laser light of, of, of a light, there is more uh, a wide area as a source of light. How do we define this in Paraview? <clears throat> you need two things. You need the back end path tracer, and you, you need to set the radius of the light to be something different than zero. So this you will see as well on your graphical user interface, it's pretty, pretty easy to find. The, last, the next step is to do reflection. So to do reflections, we will need a material definition. In this case here, I have the material copper, which is defined as a metallic type with a certain roughness and a certain reflectance. As you can see, the reflectance here, I have 0 0.78, 0 0.45, 0 0.2. This is tendentially more red because we always use red, green, and blue. This is, in fact, the color of copper. It's a reddish color, OK? Now, I did not invent those numbers. I went to the web, and there's classification of materials and colors all over the place, and in fact, 
Osprey itself. And by the way, this is the same Osprey library which we used before lunch to do volume rendering. So with the same library, I do volume rendering and I do ray tracing and path tracing. Osprey in its documentation has a list of materials, which are, which are the ones I use. And in your distribution of Paraview, under the directory materials, you have a file called osprey underscore match.json. This is the file that you should load to be able to bring into Paraview the definitions of all your materials. Okay? Now, defining this surface as copper, it's, it just happens magically. It automatically reflects light because it has a reflection, reflectance uh, characteristic here set up. And this is the picture I get. <clears throat> well, we're doing pretty good. It's, uh, we're far from OpenGL already. We have hard shadows. We have ambient light, diffuse light, reflections. But we can do more. I'm sure we can do more. We can do other type of materials. This cylinder, we can make it wood, for example. We have a picture of wood, so this is just a tile of wood. And we can map this onto the material. Now to do this, we need the so-called texture coordinates, all right? What are those texture coordinates? We can start Paraview, create a plane, really the name, the source called plane in Paraview, and it will have the following characteristics. One cell, so it's a single quadrilateral cell. It has four vertices and it has those texture coordinates. Now notice that the texture coordinates are only two scalars. It's not, in physical space, we talk about X, Y, and Z. That's three coordinates. In texture coordinate space, there's, there's only two, and it's basically U in that horizontal direction, and epsilon y in the z direction. So there is u, also called tx. It varies from 0 to 1. So this is blue, 0, 1 is red. From the left of the screen to the right, it's my texture coordinate 0. My y coordinate is pretty, pretty obvious. It goes from the bottom to the top. Now that plane, which holds texture coordinate, I can put any image I want on it. So put the image of your, of your dog or your girlfriend or whatever. There it is. So I've put a picture I found on my, on my disk here, which was clear that this was not generated on the computer. It's not a model, it's just a picture any picture of it. So replace this with the wood texture and we have our textured cylinder. This is an interesting case actually because it's very easy to put a picture onto a flat surface. But this is not a flat surface. So I can very easily go from one edge of the cylinder, go around the cylinder. It would be, I don't have a piece of paper, but no, I don't have a piece of paper. I have it here. It would be like this. This is my image and I make a cylinder out of it like this. I think you understood the principle, okay? This would be my picture, easy. But what about the top? What about this? 
And what about this? So <clears throat> that picture obviously has some problems. And if you look at it, and if you run that on your computer later on, right here in the middle, there's a boundary that is fake. OK. Well, this was for the demonstration. We can do. Pardon me? Uh, the problem is, is the following, that the texture coordinates here are set up very nice. Actually, I don't really know how they're set up, but presumably 0 to 1 around the circumference of the disk. And then the y coordinates is probably 0 to 1 like this, and it's everywhere it's 1 here. So the, the algorithm gets confused about this. It would be pretty difficult to do it with a simple textures. The best way to do it would be with a programmable texture. Yeah, you can always do tricks, but then uh, there's always problems of continuity. It's very easy to make a bad picture in computer graphics. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes? No, it doesn't help. It's really, it's really the problem is that it's difficult to define. It's difficult to map a two-dimensional space 0 to 1 to a complex geometry. That's just the problem. So. Yes. Yes. On your, uh, on your material file, you could define your own materials. You could add your own materials. So for example, for the T part, I've done a material where instead of using a, a white translucent glass, I've made a green translucent glass for the, for the lid. I'll show you the demonstration. So, because it's ASCII text, text, it's very simple to, to edit. <clears throat> so this was for texture. And the final goal is our picture right here, where we do light refraction through the material. So for, the mat for water, I have a particular material of type glass with a particular attenuation, distance, eta, etc. And this is what I get here. So that's my final version, I believe, yes, <clears throat> of, the, of the rendering. Now, Looks good as it is, but there's a lot of issues which I will now document with you about the making of this particular image. What's eta? Eta is, I don't have the slide right here, but I will show you in a different slide deck. <laughs> No, I don't have it here. Mm -hmm. So I have it over here. Project. I don't find the picture. It's basically about the index of refraction. 
the index of refraction is at the boundary of, of a certain material, light gets diffracted, gets bent into one direction, and that coefficient tells you about the, uh, the, the amount of, of deviation of the, uh, the light. So there is my picture. <clears throat> now, ray tracing is expensive, and there's a way to make it interactive in what we call progressive rendering. So when you run Paraview, you have to enable streaming to do progressive rendering. And there is a parameter here called the number of progressive passes. If you can see here the difference between the two images, this one is pretty grainy. This one is converged. So that's the difference between the two. Um, and I will give you the demonstration of this right away. So by, unfortunately, this should be a, should just happen by default. It doesn't. You have to not forget that particular option if you want to do a progressive rendering. Let's go, let's go already to the demonstration. which would be right here. So Paraview minus enabled streaming. And I will use this. There we go. So there is the material I mentioned earlier, the green glass material over here is the white translucent material. Now I just have to make sure I have the right setting. Yeah, I'm using the path tracer, so this is good. So now I can, I should be able to Aha, uh -huh, of course, yeah. Uh, this is why it took so long. Sorry. So, those are the parameters to be careful with. This was set up for a batch computation. So in batch computation, I don't do progressive rendering. I want to compute the fully converged image, then save it to the disk, and then I'm done. So I had, I had this set to do 50 samples per pixel, and I had a single progressive path. I'm going to change this completely. This will become one, and this, be, this will become 10,000. And now you'll see, the, you'll see the difference. The difference is that I can, I can change this in real time on my laptop here, move around. You can see the teapot is pretty grainy, but as soon as I stop talking, it gets better, okay? And it gets better very quickly, and that's the fun thing of it. Why is it so fast? It's because I have an option here called denoise. I have a machine learning algorithm doing image denoising, removing the noise. So as soon as it finds a couple of, not a couple, I think it's four, the minimum number, four, four images which have been progressively rendered, it knows that the best image is probably doing this and it it renders that image better. So this is the image denoiser, which is supported in hardware <coughs> on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the graphics card. So there, you see, 
Here is the interactive, and here is the image denoised. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, diffraction through the glass material. Uh, you can ask my daughter for several months in the morning when we were eating breakfast. I was looking at my cup and thinking about all possible combination of this refraction of the light through my glass cup. Uh, so now it works uh, perfectly well here. There. This is ray tracing with progressive rendering. Now, on my laptop, I have a GPU of the last generation called an RTX capable GPU. So it does this denoising and this ray tracing as fast as it can with the RT cores. If you don't have that fast GPU, actually Pete's Dane itself is a generation earlier. It's the Pascal GPU. <clears throat> we can still do the same ray tracing, but at a slower speed. And that will come. In fact, in November, we will upgrade the drivers, etc., on the machine, and then I will be able to do this uh, ray tracing as well. If you don't have any GPU at all, and that's actually often the case, you can go to the Osprey Path Tracer. So this is the last of our option over here. Well, we have the GPU option with the optics library, or we have the Osprey the support with the Intel Osprey library, which is CPU only. And there are some slight differences. Actually, one of them here is pretty obvious. I don't know if you noticed. Here, there's the reflection of the green uh, lead. If I go back to optics, that reflection is lost. OK? That, yeah, exactly the same, yeah. So that is, I'm talking about this zone here, which should be green, and it's not. And if I use the Intel library, it is green. So this is a bug in the NVIDIA library, and they've, they're talking with me, they're interacting with me about fixing this. It will be solved, it will be solved. Good, this is done on the CPU, by the way, only on my CPU. Actually, I can hear the fan here. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's, uh, it's using quite a bit of resources, but it's multi-threaded. So again, I can move that more or less interactively, and as I let the mouse go, it will improve the machine, the, the image. It uses a different denoiser, Intel has its own image denoiser library. And in fact, if you go to the, if you Google for Intel open image denoiser, there's a very nice demo where you can go from the on and off version. It clearly demonstrates the uh, advantage of this denoiser. There, so that's it for, for the T part. Yes. It's possible, yeah. There are some, I've played enough with those multiple versions of the libraries. There are some differences, yes, uh, that uh, I think are scene specific and also material specific. It's not clear. For the moment, the two libraries use an intersection, I would say, of parameters for the, dis the definitions of the characteristics of the material. This is not fully merged. There is now an effort led by Peter Mesmer of NVIDIA in Switzerland to actually make all those libraries 
use exactly the same characteristics for materials, for lights, etc., so that we will have a u completely uniform uh, rendering of images. So there are, that's very good. There are some differences. Let's continue with our presentation. <clears throat> Depth of field is another very important feature. If, if some of you have done uh, some uh, uh, amateur photography, amateur or professional photography, you know it very well. With a, a nice reflex, you can set, you can decide on your depth of field. You can blur out things you don't want on your picture. Well, you can do the same with Paraview as well with the feature focal distance and focal disk in your camera setting. So this would be on my graphical user interface here, the settings for the camera. And here's the, here are the images. There's, see a blur context over here in the front of the camera. My second image has the focus in the, in the middle and my third, my last image has the focus here in front. There are again some artifacts. For example, right over here, this, those, uh, those tooth-like rendering. This is something I will have to, uh, I will have to fix in a later version. But at least this demonstrates that I can really vary the depth of field based on the focal distance. So what is this focal distance here that we have to set? It's exactly the distance between the camera position and the point of focal uh, rendering, okay? So here I've used 14, here I've used 29, and here I've used 39, I believe, for those examples. And I believe I also gave you the script to do this particular rendering. So you can exercise that as well. Now let's come to the problems. <clears throat> Tim, Tim Bidert at NVIDIA in Germany is the person who has helped me a lot in making this work on our Quest system here where we had quite a bit of issues and then generally speaking he's given me a lot of tips about rendering and he pointed me out to this to chapter I think 14 of the ray tracing gems this has a beautiful illustration of the following problems if you have a container with water for example where would you put the boundary would you do this with a unique boundary would you do a block of water inside a container like it is here or would you do an additional epsilon? In other words, have a block of water that is slightly bigger than your container to put inside. Why is that so? Why should I worry about this? Is that I'm doing ray tracing. I'm working on the digital world, the computer world. Everything is limited by, the, by floating point precision. So when, my, when I traverse my volume here, when I get over here, I have exactly two materials touching each other, but I don't know which one is which. Is it the glass? Is it the water? How much is this epsilon? What should happen? The glass container has, has a certain index of, of refraction. The water has another index of refraction. You understand the point? Okay, the point is all about numerical precision. So those are the options. And there are still some difficulties there because it's the, it's the digital world. So you have to be aware of those difficulties. Second thing, second example, from my demonstration here. The nice cylinder. Earlier, I told you that 
I had taken, you could take an image, wrap it like this into a cylinder very, very good. Uh, in my earlier version of the, of the cylinder, I had taken a block of paper, you know, like a block knot of 100 pages like this, which I had wrapped around like this. And that was my cylinder. It was, very, it, was, it was very simple to build, just like that. OK, except that at the edge of the block, I had two surfaces touching each other like that. And those two, those two surfaces touching each other, it was wrong. It was wrong because it was an arbitrary surface which in reality should not exist. And it showed artifact. Sure enough, the ray tracing was perfectly good in that it showed that error. So how did I go about this? I created, instead of creating a single grid which was warped like this, I created an hexahedral grid where, where on the edge of the cylinder, the indices of the vertices are equal, such that from the point of view of paraview, from the geometric modeling point of view, there's no artificial boundary. It looks like empty space. So it takes a bit of work because I had to construct this uh, by hand, well, in my head, then I had to write an algorithm to make that cylinder correctly with the correct index, but that fixed the problem. So that was one problem. Second problem was right here at the boundary, it wasn't just like taking the cylinder and putting it here on top and saying, okay, life is good. No, life is not good. You have epsilon, you have an epsilon between the plate and the bottom of the uh, container. That epsilon creates trouble. So Tim, again, at NVIDIA said, oh, you know, the easiest, the easiest way is just to push the cylinder down. This is the view from the bottom. Push it underneath the surface, and then we're done. It's just like hiding what you want, what you don't want to see under the carpet. We're done. Who cares? That's my job is to make it look right. <laughs> okay? Question. Yeah, what's the next one? So you're saying, uh, what I'm saying is that if you, if you simply model this container as being on top of the surface, it's not clear what is the distance between the plate and the container. It's epsilon in the, in the, in the sense that it's infinitesimally, infinitesimally small, but it's not zero. And from the point of view of the numerical precision of the ray tracing, that creates trouble. So in the demo that you have, you will see that this cylinder is pushed by, I think, 0 0.1 below the surface just to avoid those problems. So this is one. This is another one problem of geometric. Uh, this is yet another problem. There. So making a picture right with ray tracing is pretty complicated. Application. I have one here with the plunging jet video, which I showed earlier. This was an early version of the video. So we have air bubbles in a column of water. Pretty simple, two-phase two liquid simulation. And the bubbles were shown earlier with an ISO, with an ISO surface of the volume fraction at 0 0.5. So everything above 0 0.5 was air. And I could show those as little, little blobs 
in the, in the space, but that was not satisfactory at all. All right? So instead of doing ISO surfaces, I did ISO volumes of the volume fraction. I computed the external surface of those, each of those bubbles to put normals. And I gave them a water material for path tracing. So basically, oh, I thought I had another slide comparing the two, but anyway, that came up to the movie we have here, which doesn't work, yes. So I'll show you the movie and then we'll discuss the details. There it is. So there's one time step of the movie. And this is just a volume of water standing by itself, which doesn't exist in reality. You need a container around it. But there's no container. You know, you know exactly why now. Because of those limited precision problems I had. I had trouble putting here a glass container around. So for the moment, I have, a, I have an early version. I have a version of the video with the container, but it shows some artifacts. So basically here, we have water, and then we have those bubbles of air uh, through the uh, internally. Each of those images took about a couple of minutes each image, a couple of minutes, on the compute nodes of Pitts date. So it's not cheap. But for, fortunately, thanks to the progressive rendering, I can debug, I can prototype this in real time, as you've seen it. And then for the final version of the video, I go to full precision, and then I get my nice, my nice uh, video here. OK? All right, so. OK, just a quick question. Yes. Uh, how long does it take, given the material you have, the, like, the input data, like simulation of it? How, how long does it take to generate such a video? With your level of experience? Well, with my, in one afternoon, I can make a prototype for you. Yes. Okay. So for the newbies like newcomers like myself or uh, one of you, how long would yeah. it take? Yeah. Take, uh, it, it would take six months. No, just kidding. We've, we've seen through this, my presentation, what, the, what are the problems. Well, first of all, how, how do you do it? You have to define materials. So each of your objects must have a material. In most cases, most objects should have normals, you know, the, those vectors that are clearly defined. In fact, there was a couple of weeks ago, somebody on the mailing list saying, oh, I'm trying to do this type of things, and things look completely wrong, and this is a bug, etc." I said, wait a second, give me your model. I took a copy of their model and they had surface normals that were all over the place. It was completely, their geometric model was completely wrong. So first and most important thing, get a clean geometric model. By clean, I mean the normals should be set up correctly. There should be no intersection, like I, in the case of the cylinder, there should be no things like this. There should be no room where the digital, the, the limits of the precision of the arithmetic will uh, provide 
problems. Then you define your materials, you test it, you define your lights. I actually had to, to struggle quite a bit with the positioning of the lights in Paraview. It's not very user friendly. It's there, but positioning the light is a bit complex. You test your shadows, things should look right. And only at the end, you go into the path tracing mode where you do this uh, refraction and all this, the fancy effect. But having the clean geometry is the most important point. Yes, I do remember. The grid size is pretty small, actually. It's, uh, it's 1,024 in the elevation and 512 square on the, on the base. OK? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, that's a good question because what matters here, it's not the volume of the data. The only thing that matters if you've studied optics is that there is a surface boundary here and a surface boundary outside when you leave the block. Whatever happens inside the volume of water it's, it's, uh, it's trivial, it's just a straight line. The light travels in a straight line inside the air. It hits the volume of water, it changes direction, and then travels again in a straight light, straight line, and then it exits the, wa the water and gets diffracted again. But the size of the volume really doesn't matter. This was my early mistake. Uh, at the very beginning, I thought, oh my gosh, is it going to take more computation because the, the volume here is, is very big? It really doesn't matter. It's the surface materials that matter. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Well, yeah. So here in my case, I have the bubble, so I have to do multiple traversal of material boundaries, OK? Uh, there, so that's all I have for ray tracing. So we, haven't, we have a demonstration of it. Of course, it would be too, too much wanting, wanting to do this as an exercise. But I, have I think I have provided on Daint the uh, demonstration. And the first one to test is this ray tracing this ray tracing script. And there. So when I have, once I have this on my screen over here. I can, for example, for the, for the mirrors, I can change the material. So if I go to my material, to my material interface, uh, here I have copper. If I change that to glass, there's my green glass, OK? And so forth. If you have, if I set it to wood, this would be my wood texture, which is obviously wrong. If I have aluminum, this would be the rendering, and so forth, and so on. And if I say none, I go back to a fully opaque paint, just like the wall over here. This is paint, this is matte rendering. 
Oh, and I wanted to show you, oops, sorry about that. There. There's my cylinder. I wanted to show you underneath. See, there's a piece of cylinder right here. Here's how I, here's how I should do it. I should remove everything. Aha! In that demonstration, I, b I have both the old glass and the new glass. So I will show you. Okay, do you see the problem? Where's the problem? Right here. Okay. Uh, here's the new glass. So I will put the new glass and remove the old glass. And that problem has disappeared. Okay. Over here. No, 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 no. I didn't know. There's no... There's no such trick. In fact, I'm going to show you now how you, how you debug those particular things. Uh, let's turn off volume rain. Let's turn off ray tracing over here. Okay, so that's exactly it right here. What do you find out if your, if your geometry has problems? <coughs> this is classic OpenGL rendering. No ray tracing here. I take my object and I change its transparency to something smaller. See, there's the problem right here. When you do transparent geometry, semi-transparent geometry in computer graphics, all the problems show up. That's, that's a guarantee. So this is the best way to debug your geometry. So this is my old glass, okay? I will turn off the old glass and I will show the new glass Okay, there it is right here. I turn on its opacity to something else. And see here, it looks perfectly good. There's no, there's no edges anywhere. All right? So that's how you debug things. Is that clear? Yeah? So I gave you one of my tricks here. Go back to classic OpenGL and use semi-transparent rendering and sure enough the problems will, will show up.